diagnosis. Um, it's easy to perform. You, your skin is out there, um, easy to get to, and the, the procedure is not that um, invasive or that horrible of a deal. There's different types of biopsies. We have curette or curettage biopsy, snip, scissor, shave, punch, incision, incisional, I cannot talk with you guys, <laughs> or wedge, and then an excisional biopsy. All right, let's talk about kind of when we use each one of these biopsies. A curettage, and again, I'll show, I've got pictures of all these. Remember, the curettage is kind of that um, scoop type of a thing. It's a rounded instrument. One edge is very, very sharp. The other edge is not. It's like a looped. Um, and this just is, you're only going to kind of scrape the, the surface. You're not going to go deep at all with this. We use this a lot on molluscum. You know, they're just kind of sitting up on top and you just get at the edge of it and, and pull it up. Uh, Seborrheic keratoses, Professor um, Brooks talked to you about those. Those just sit up on top of the skin and, you know, when they're, they're not freezing off real well with cryotherapy, sometimes I'll just kind of scrape them down like that with a curatage. Now, have I used that for biopsy purposes? Occasionally. Um, if I am 100% certain that this lesion is a basal cell, and instead of biopsying today and bringing them back, you know, they're an elderly person and they can't get in very easily. Before I do the EDNC, electrodesiccation and curatage treatment for that cancer, I'll just scrape a, a bit with the, the curatage and send that off and, and get confirmation that yes, it, it was a, a basal cell before I, before I do the, and then I proceed with the EDNC. But that's not your typical way to, um, to get a biopsy or to remove something. Um, snip scissor. This is a, a good for something that's kind of elevated up off the surface of the skin, maybe a fleshy mole, a, a skin tag. You use this procedure all the time, or technique, all the time with uh, uh, skin tags. Filiform wart. A filiform wart, I don't think we talked about. Those are warts that are really projected off the skin and they have like these finger projections. Um, they tend to be pretty slender, um, but they are really lifted up off the, the surface of the skin. So you just get um, uh, pickups, kind of lift it up, and just scissor it down at the base. A shave biopsy is by far the most common. You're going to use, well, you can use a blade, um, like the 15 or number 10 blade. Remember what that those look like? Mm -hmm. The 15 blade is, I'm not a good drawer, is more like that. And the, oops, <laughs> the, the um, 10 blade is much bigger. That's going to be more what you do surgeries with. So what you can do is, again, kind of um, apply lateral pressure and just kind of, like a machete, just kind of, <laughs> not quite that hard or aggressive, but and just kind of slice through it. More commonly is when you, I guess I have to talk about this a bit, is a, is a plain old razor blade, either single-sided or double-sided. I always just say <coughs> a single-sided or half a one. Um, and you get either end, you kind of bend it, and you just rock it um, and get through the skin. But this one, is you can remove something superficially, like a, a mole, again, that's kind of lifted off. You can just use it to, to, to level it down, or you can go deeper, get a deeper dermal shave that we call a saucerization. <clears throat> Say you've got a, a large lesion, um, and you want to try to get the whole thing, or at least get down pretty deep, um, you can use that technique. So lesions that extend into the mid or lower dermis, you're going to use this. I kind of want you to know which ones you're going to use for more superficial things and which ones you're going to use for more deeper tissue. A punch, this is probably the second most common. 
um, you pretty much punch rashes. I, I tend to shave more lesions like a, a potential cancer. I will just get a, a shave biopsy of it. For a punch, I want to get all the way through it and um, will tend to use more punch biopsies. So this is down into the deeper dermis. Sometimes you can use it to remove a small mole. You know, say here's your your mole that is three millimeters in diameter. I may want to get like a five millimeter punch to make sure I get the entire the entire mole. And the punches are anywhere from two millimeter diameter to ten millimeter in diameter. An incisional biopsy, you are not trying to get the whole lesion. You know you're not getting uh, a lesion. But this is when like uh, a very deep inflammatory rash, there, an example is erythema nodosum. We didn't talk about it, but that is lots of infl inflammation deep in the, the dermis and probably superficial subcutaneous fat. Um, so when you want to get a larger piece of tissue very deep, probably down into the subcutaneous fat, um, you might use this. I've never really done that that I can recall. And, a, and an excisional biopsy, say like melanoma. Uh, that looks pretty suspicious to me for melanoma. So I just want to cut the whole shebang out right now and send that off for pathology. That it, you do definitely get down to the subcutaneous or at least the deep dermal, but uh, down to the subcutaneous. I, uh, erythema nodosum, I think should pro that example of erythema nodosum is more for an incisional biopsy than an excisional biopsy. I apologize. Now, anytime you do an excisional biopsy, it's a heck of a lot more time consuming. You know, doing a shade biopsy or a punch biopsy, that takes two minutes, you know, or two to five minutes. When you're excising something, um, it, it, 30 minutes to an hour. Another positive thing about an excisional biopsy, especially for a mole or something like that, you know, when you are shaving, sh getting a shave biopsy, you're leaving a... <laughs> a scar or a lesion, you know, that's kind of like that, um, where when you excise something, you can bring those edges back together and you'll have just a linear scar versus that kind of a scar. This is going to heal a lot quicker than that, you know, open wound there. All right, so let's talk about where do we want to biopsy from to get the to give the pathologist the best information. Um, <clears throat> when you're when you have a tumor, a, a neoplasm, you want to make sure that you get the thickest part of the tumor, and you want to make sure you're not getting all the just necrotic tissue or crust. Say, for example, a um, basal cell. Oftentimes, as they get more advanced, they get that indentation that, that's just all crusty. You don't want to take your biopsy from the middle of that because all that's going to show you is crust. Um, you want to get that, you know, out to more of the side and make sure you get some of that good tissue. It, it, more of a rash inflammatory process. Um, you want to get a, an earlier lesion. Sometimes people have come in and they've just been scratching and that you know they've got excoriations and crusting all over the place. That's not the best place to get your sample again because you're. Um, it's just try to get an early spot, one that's not all scratched up. And then we've talked to you know just yesterday I think it was um, a blister or an ulcer. The best place to get that when you're getting the the a biopsy of the actual lesion is at the edge of that blister. You ideally would like to get, say this is your blister, you would like to get some tissue kind of extending 
involved area, non involved area, or kind of going in from, well, yeah, or like this. Okay? So get the edge of, a, of an ulcer um, or a blister. There's no real absolute contraindications to a biopsy. You want to be extra careful with you know, biopsies on real superficial when there's not a whole lot of dermis below, such as the template you have like a, a big artery <laughs> underneath it. Kind of have to be a little careful and not get too deep. Um, such as the temple, sometimes mm -hmm. on the back of the hand, places like that. Anything that's pulsatile gives you an idea, or you know, you think there is, uh, it's an artery. Cystic midline mass. Again, you've, you've probably heard or you will in pediatrics that sometimes these lesions that are midline, like in the center of the, the back, um, can sometimes potentially have involvement with the, the spinal column. And you always have to be concerned about potential scarring. Keloid, there are certain people that just will keloid with everything, even pimple lesions. I have had a number of people that have keloids all over their chest and back just from pimples. Um, the chest is by far the worst about, about keloiding. The upper back, you get ugly scars because there's just so much, you know, pulling on that, that scar tissue. If you could immobilize them, they, they develop a nice pretty scar, but nobody's going to do that. And um, just as you're forming that scar tissue, it just on the back it either gets uh, keloid, keloidal, or it just you, you start off with a nice linear line and it just gets all stretched out and then it looks big and ugly. Chest is by far the worst about keloiding, so always ask about uh, do you tend to keloid? Informed consent. You want to inform your patient what you're doing why you're doing it, what are the potential risks with it, bleeding, infection. Infection is actually quite low, um, but you always have to inform. I don't, there shouldn't be a need to start somebody on oral antibiotic or really even topical antibiotic after a biopsy, just a routine biopsy, just because the risk is so low, except I might consider it on the, the distal lower extremities, because that those heal, or the, the foot, um, because those heal so slowly. The further away from you, the heart you get, the slower things heal. Um, especially then if you have somebody who has venous insufficiency or something like that, oh my gosh, it's gonna take forever for that to heal. Um, and they're at greater risk for infection. So I, that is when I will consider starting either topical probably topical antibiotic, um, possibly oral antibiotic, just prophylactically. Local anesthesia, I'm not gonna go too much into that. Lidocaine is typically what you use, 1%. Um, sometimes they'll get lidocaine with epi. You know, most derm offices are gonna have both. Um, Epinephrine helps with hemostasis because it vasoconstricts, and we mainly use that um, just because there's less bleeding to have to mess with after you get your biopsy. Now, the, you need to know don't use epinephrine on distal things such as the nose, the fingers, the toes, the penis, things like that. Do we use it? Yes, we do, especially on the face. Um, in fact, I remember that. I told you that story about me being on the floor with my dog, and we, did I tell you that? Oh my gosh. <laughs> okay, this was years ago. I had two chocolate Labradors, Lisa and Brennell. I didn't tell you this? No. Oh my gosh, yeah. Uh, I'm a nerd. I love the sound of music. It's my favorite movie ever. And so the oldest and youngest daughters are Lisa and Gretel, and, and so we named our puppies, Lisa and Gretel, and they were sisters, and they were puppies, and I'm a dog freak, and so I was down on the floor just loving and playing with Lisa, who was the, they're no longer alive, but um, she was the sweetest, most kind-hearted little thing. Gretel was the ornery one and constantly <laughs> in trouble, 
Um, and so I'm playing down there with Liesl, and she accidentally got a hold of my nostril, and we went in opposite directions, and I went to the emergency room and had to get 15 stitches in my nose. Up, up in my nose. It was like you lifted it, and it was just like, <laughs> It was messed up. So anyway, you know, here I'm uh, thinking, oh, I'm gone through PA school, and uh, they... I see afterwards, after he's got his stitches in me, my nose is like real pale from the epinephrine. And I'm like, oh my god, <laughs> like, I'm going to decross my nose. And, um, so I asked the nurse about it, and she's like, no, 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 we use that all the time. This was before I got into derm. And she's like, no, we use epinephrine all the time on the face because it just bleeds so, so much. Um, so, and yes, we do. Uh, maybe not in as high quantities, but yeah, make me panic just a little bit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Dan will, excuse me, Dr. McNeil will still to this day teases me about that because I was working at OU with him when, when that all happened. <laughs> yes, he never forgets a thing, does he? <laughs> okay, um, you can't, I think one time. I had a person who was allergic to lidocaine, and she had been tested at an allergist, and no, she could not have that. She told me, I can't remember, I want to say it was procaine she could use, so I had to order, she wanted a, a mole off, it didn't look concerning or anything, so it wasn't urgent, but I said, okay, let me, we don't have any of that, so let me order some, and she came back at a later time when I could use that. It, when I did this last year, I learned about this, that sometimes you can use diphenhydramine um, solution uh, to use as an anesthetic. Um, you, you dilute it just a little bit. I told you how to, to do that, but I thought, gosh, that's kind of handy if you're in the emergency room and you need something that's probably not as effective as, as lidocaine, but gosh, it, better than nothing, that's for darn sure. Um, you know, when you inject lidocaine, it is pretty painful because it's very acidic. Um, so ways to help with that is to more slowly infuse. Um, we would use a lot of, you buffer it with sodium bicarb. <clears throat> that eases the discomfort a lot. Using a, a smaller bore needle, remember, the bigger the number, the, the smaller it is. Pinching or tapping that using eyes. I did, I went to a um, class down in Texas to, because I suffer, you told me, with hyperhidrosis. And yes, yeah, so I'm, you know, <laughs> sweating up here. Um, but I learned how to give um, Botox injections into the palms, and they taught us to use eyes, where you, and you know, it takes. It would take, like, for my small hand, about 100 units in this hand, 100 units in this hand. So you just, like, centimeter, centimeter, you know, wow. increments. So you're doing 100 shots in a hand. And, but with each one, they had these little um, tubular ice, pieces of ice, and you'd wrap it in some gauze and apply, like, 7 to 10 seconds of cold pressure, lift it up, and, and do your injection apply the cold pressure, lift it up, do your injection. And it was amazing. I saw a patient who I did this to. I mean, it takes forever, but um, she, she had had this done without that process, and she said it is amazing how much better tolerated it is. So, just FYI. Emla or lidocaine. Um, go with what... Um, Dr. Latassi has to say about that, okay? Um, that yes, it can help. I'm not in the camp that it really does help that much, but in her notes, um, she it encourages that, so go with that. Go with what she says about that, okay? You're getting what I'm saying? There might be a test question in that regard. I'm just not convinced. You know, sometimes um, my supervising physician would recommend to kids a lot or the parents of the kids to, you know, wrap 
Emla this lidocaine stuff and come back in an hour, go have lunch, and we'll wrap it. And I was just like, let's get her done, you know. <laughs> just and they're gonna quit crying in two seconds after it's all done. Uh, I just don't think it helped because they're freaking out anyway. Um, so, but for a procedure in an adult, I think it it could help. All right, when you are locally anesthetizing something, you tip, you know, you are going to be able to tell. You don't want to get it way down into the subcutaneous fat because um, it's not going to, unless if your biopsy is going way down there. Uh, typically, you want to get it in with the dermis, and you can tell with your needle when you get past that that dermis. It's going to kind of give way, and when you know you're in the in not in the subcutaneous tissue or fat is, and it will uh, produce a wheel. Hemostasis. We used a heck of a lot of the ferrous sulfate. Uh, Monsell solution is a ferric. Uh, fair iron product, um, either one of those can stain the skin. So we don't like to use those on the face. I would go with the aluminum chloride. These are just solutions products that are, um, will cauterize. All right, so you put some of that on a Q-tip and, a, you know, firmly apply that to the base of your biopsy and it will help it to stop <coughs> bleeding. But remember that the ferrous sulfate and the mon cells can stain the skin, so you don't want to use that for sure on the face. Cautery, you can just use heat. You've seen those old old movies where they put their, their sword or whatever in the fire and then, you know, to get the bleeding to stop. Same thinking. Pressure. Uh, there is a gel foam. Sometimes in a smaller punch, you don't maybe necessarily need a suture, so sometimes you'll just fill it with this absorbable sponge. And then you just stuff that in there. I have never used that quick relief powder, so forget that. And obviously a suture is going to stop the bleeding too. Alright, so here's some pictures. Curatage, again, you're just kind of scraping, scraping the top epidermal component. Snip or scissor, that's good for something that's elevated off the skin. I have used a, a scissor biopsy to, to use similar to the um, uh, curette, but it's not as effective as just a blade. Uh, okay, so the shape biopsy, um, you're going to inject you do want to get a wheel because that kind of lifts that lesion up so it's easier to get under <clears throat> with your shave. You're always going to kind of apply some lateral pressure just to stabilize the, the lesion because as you are using your, your blade it, and you're using a rocking motion, it's going to move on you. So get it stabilized so it's not moving around on you. To get it deeper, you just squeeze the, those ends together so it's more concave. Make sense? That is um, more using a 15 blade, which I don't particularly like. And then that is using the, the razor blade. So again, you just kind of start at an angle and you just rock it back and forth and you guide it as to how deep you want to go. All right, a punch. With this one, you want to determine what way the skin lines are running. Okay, and a good way to do that is to kind of pinch the skin together, and you'll kind of see the natural skin lines. Um, because you kind of want to, going with those skin lines makes the, a, better, a better scar. So again, you're going to infiltrate with an anesthetic. Get your punch, whatever size punch, like this. I said, okay, I've got a three millimeter um, mole in the middle. I'm going to get a couple millimeter of uh, good tissue, healthy tissue, and so I'm going to use a five millimeter punch. 
Now what you want to do is, okay, say your skin lines are running this way. Okay, you want to go perpendicular to that and kind of apply lateral pressure so you stretch that out just a little bit. Okay, then when you do your punch and it comes back together, it's more of an oval rather than a perfect circle. Okay, and why do we want to do that? Because when you try to suture together a perfect circle, you pull that up and you tend to get that. You get little ears sticking up. When you've got more of an oval, it's going to come together much more nicely and easily. Now, at the bigger punch you get, the more you need to do that. It's pretty easy to pull together without having those dog ears um, with like a, for sure a two, three, maybe even a four, especially on the back. But if you're getting up to a 10 millimeter, that's hard not to get dog ears. And using the punch, you just do a uh, push down on it gently as you are just doing circular motions. And you will feel when it gives way through the subcutaneous. <clears throat> You're going to then get your pickups, lift it up, and uh, cut it down below the subcutaneous fat. If you get down that far, but you should be able to. I do think, you know, we, there tends to be a what we call a hub, um, which will allow it only to go so far. You really don't want to get down to the hub, you know, go down several several millimeters <coughs> deep if it's on a very superficial, you don't have much dermis, such as the back of the hand, the temple area, places like that. You, you, again, you can feel when you get through there. Don't keep shoving just because you can. And those are the skin tension lines that I was talking about. And here's the punch biopsy. So again, you get that lateral pressure um, perpendicular to the skin lines. Get your specimen. And then typically you're going to put one suture, unless if you've got a, a 10 millimeter punch, then you might need more to bring those edges. I'm not even going to talk about this one. That's just when you're going to kind of get a, a V cone kind of a thing within. You're not trying to get the whole thing. An excision, excisional biopsy, is when you are trying to get the whole thing and you want good clean margins around the area. Again, you want to, um, you, you, your goal is to get down through the epidermis the dermis and get down to the subcutaneous fat. And then you uh, bring it together with sutures. Again, you want to determine the direction of those tension lines, skin tension lines, so you can go along with that. You want the long par parallel of your line, of your incision line, to go along with that, those skin lines. Your goal is to have your, it's kind of three to one. Let me see if I can. Kind of three to one. Um, one part that's three times as long as it is wide is, is what you want. So that, again, when you bring those edges back together, they lay together nicely. They come together nicely. You don't get in dog ears. About 30 degree angles at each corner. You draw, an, you know, around your your lesion. You draw an ellipse around that lesion. You're generally going to have, depending upon what it is, um, determines how much extra tissue, healthy tissue margins you you have. Like melanoma, you want one centimeter on each side. Um, for like basal cell, probably three millimeters is on each side is fine. I'm not going to go into this too. When, all right, so when you, 
you've got your blade, the very point of your blade, although it's a, you use a rounded a ten, number 10 blade, you take your point and you kind of hold the instrument like a pencil, all right? You're going to go straight down perpendicular and, and get it through the skin. And then as you are coming around one edge of it, you're going to get onto the belly of, of your blade, okay? Because that's where it's the sharpest. So, and you want to try to go as perpendicular as you can to the skin, trying not to angle it in or out, because then it's harder to bring those edges back together. Does that make sense? Bring it all around to the one side, trying not to go, say here's your, where you drew your ellipse on there's what you're trying to um, cut out. As you come around here, you want to try to stop and lift that your blade up so that you get to the point right here. If you keep going or you lift it up too late, then you're going to get this cross hatch. Is that making sense? So point it in at a, at a perpendicular, kind of get it down to the belly as you're coming around, and then lift it back up so you're perpendicular again. And do the same thing with the other side. Every now and then, or you sometimes do have to go back and cut again. You don't get all the way through, especially on real thick dermis, say on the back. Um, you have to go, you just don't want to, you know, hack it up in there and have a bunch of different, try to keep in that same line, incision line. Um, and then you lift that and you gently, you can cut it or use your, um, your blade to kind of cut it down below the, the subcutaneous, into the subcutaneous fat. Oftentimes, especially a larger wound, you're going to um, undermine. And what that is, is where you kind of lift, say I've got this tissue out. And here I've just got subcutaneous fat under there. You're going to kind of lift that. You're going to get your scissors, apply, you know, and put that just below the dermis, between the dermis and the subcutaneous fat. Okay? And you're going to put it in and then stretch them out. Put it in, stretch them out. Put it in, just, just like anatomy when you did cadaver. Um, so you're going to do that. You're going to do that around here. And that really helps to relieve tension on the, the sutures. Oh, it does allow those skin edges to, to evert a little bit better. Different types of uh, suture material. You're going to, for below the skin, you're going to use absorbable. There, you're not going to have to remove those. The body will absorb them. Vicryl is the main one I've worked with. PDS, you might recognize that. Um, so they are deep in the dermis and they absorb on their own. Larger wounds where, you, again, you don't want as much tension on these ones that are on the outside of the skin. The uh, non-absorbable sutures, <laughs> silk, nylon, ethylon is the big one that you hear about, or proline. <clears throat> the size of, or the diameter of the suture material matters. You want a smaller diameter, a 3.0 or 4, excuse me. It's actually a, a larger diameter, again. The larger diameter, the lower the number. Okay, does that, just remember that. A 3.0 or 4.0 is actually a larger diameter than a 5.0 or 6.0. So you're going to use the 3.0 or 4.0, 4.0 more on the body and scalp. On the face, you're going to use a 5.0 or 6.0 because that's real, I mean, fine, fine stuff. Again, you want the long axis of your your ellipse to go along the skin tension lines to go with that so it's the better and you want a three to one ratio. For subcutaneous sutures again you're just going to have to do this one day. Um, 
Basically what you do though is you, you start down low and come up um, just at the very top, just below the epidermis. Go back in on the other side just below and you tie and you want to mainly cut the, cut the string so everything is down below the skin. You don't want some of your, your, your suture material sticking out because the, the skin can't close up around that. Make sense? When you suture on the outside of the skin, you, you try to go <coughs> perpendicular to the skin and you just rock your, your wrist um, so that you try to get equal amounts within that along with the needle on each side and you're coming up about the same distance from your incision. Again, I, I'm not getting, this is all you're going to get more of this when you're out on your rotations, but um, I think I tried to emphasize some of this stuff that you need to know more for the test purpose. Be familiar with some of the names of the absorbable, non-absorbable. Um, know the kind of what we emphasize with the excision, you know, three to one ratio, that sort of thing. Any questions? No.